All right, so last, last time we started to talk about the junctions. So let me recall you, uh, recall the situation. The junction is a case where you have, for each object in a certain category, uh, you have a morphism called eta x, which is then going to be called the unit of the, of the junction, to some object which we call f of x, and so it's even u f of x. So there is an object f of x in another category d, and the property is that whenever you take any morphism f to so, I forgot to say you have a forgetful functor from D to C. And so, you say when I have any morphism in C from X to U, Y, then there is a unique arrow from mm. F of X to Y called F hat. Well, whatever, uh, whatever its name is, we don't care actually in such a way that if you apply the u functor to f hat, that diagram commutes, which of course if I hadn't given you an example last time, you would have trouble understanding. So the example we had last time was if you take the category of sets for C, sets and functions between sets, and u uh, is the functor from the category of monoids and monoid homomorphisms that forgets the monoid structure and only in keeps uh, the, the underlying sets, then what we have produced is uh, there is a way of building a monoid f of x, which is actually the free monoid on the alphabet x, which has that complicated property and we took that as a definition of an adjunction. So then last time I was a bit over ambitious. I told you, well, and I would like to tell you that O is left adjoint to Pt, or by the way, in that situation, f actually becomes a functor, and we are in a situation where f is left adjoined to u. So last time I told you, well, in fact, next time, that is today, we're going to see that u, sorry, o, is left adjoined to pt. Um, but I realized that was probably a bit ambitious. I'll do that in a few minutes. Th that's a bit ambitious because it's an adjunction between two categories, and one of these is the op of a category. So, I probably told you that already, but the op of a category is an extremely simple operation uh, that l makes you lose your mind almost instantly. So, <laughs> machines understand that perfectly well, and human beings uh, are completely lost. So, uh, I'll tell you what that is, so that you don't have to wait for me to tell you what it is. But if you've got a category C, you build the opposite category C up in the following way. Each time you have an object in C, call it X, you have an object in C up and it's also X. So they have exactly the same object. You don't change anything here. Um, uh, the puzzling thing is that morphi is on morphisms. That says that if you have a morphism from X to Y in C, uh, well, uh, that means you have a morphism from y to x in C op. That is the only thing you do. Remember that the category is just a graph. Okay? You just reverse the direction of all arrows. Now composition, uh, if you have composition, well, in this category, you may compose f followed by g. This is called g composed with f. But in C op, the diagram you get has all arrows reversed. So what you build here is actually f composed with g in c op. In c op. So if you, by the way, if you try to model all that in cock, uh, some people have done it for a long time, okay? But if you want to model all that in cock, that small composition sign can't be a small composition sign. It's composition applied to category C to uh, the proof that it's a category and so on, okay? To, uh, and then after the tenth argument, you get to f and g. Mm, okay? And so uh, what people have tried to do, starting with Amokran Seibi in the 90s, was to have implicit notation so that, that you didn't have to write all these implicit data. But these implicit data have, a, have some form of usefulness, okay? 
just to distinguish between these two things, for example. <laughs> okay, so we'll talk about that mess with opposite categories later. Let's start with a, another adjunction which doesn't need you to reverse arrows. So it so turns out that there is a category top, so the objects are topological spaces, and the morphisms are the continuous maps, And there's another category, which is traditionally called SOB, whose objects are the sober topological spaces, and whose morphisms are the same. They are the continuous maps but between sober spaces. Um, there is a forgetful functor, not in any adjunction sense, at least for now, but at least in an intuitive sense, which is that if you start from a sober space, you can for forget that it was sober and just keep the fact that it's a topological space. So there is a functor u from sub to top, which essentially does nothing. Okay. It just forgets. And, uh, well, I claim, theorem, I claim that uh, remember, we had built a sobrification of a space. Well, sobrification is a functor which is left adjoined to that forgetful functor. So actually, this is really a forgetful functor that is a right adjoint. And the left adjoint is the sobrification functor. So I had said what the sobrification functor did at the level of objects. The sobrification of the topological space X is the set of irreducible closed subsets C of X with a topology, of course, and the topology had as opens all the sets diamond U defined as being the set of irreducible closed subsets C in that space, so the points here, which intersect U. And so you do that for every, for each open set of X. And we had seen that that, that was actually topology. So uh, the diamond operator, at least for, on S of X, commutes with finite intersections, commutes with arbitrary unions, so in particular, that, that class of objects is closed under finite intersections and arbitrary unions. So this is a topology. That doesn't even, I don't even have to say it generates topology. This is already the full topology. And we had seen a few things, by the way, like S of X is always sober. That will, that will be useful later. And we had seen there was a map eta x, oh, that's not a complete uh, random notation, okay, which goes from x to s of x, but we hadn't said much. We had said, well, it's a continuous map, so we were not very precise, categorically uh, speaking, and uh, this maps x to um, either the downward closure of x in the specialization ordering of x, and that is also equal to the closure in X of the one element set X. And so this close in particular, and that was irreducible close, so it's an element of S of X. And that map was continuous. And it was also, and continuous is what we will really need. And it was also, uh, so let me remind you, that means that the inverse image of every open set is open. And that was just U, okay? So in particular, that was open. Uh, um, and it was continuous and always open, meaning that um, every open set is the eta minus one of some open set, which is also obvious from that formulation. And a continuous almost open and injective map is a topological embedding. So if x is, is t0, this is when eta is injective, then this can be seen as a subspace embedding. So you can see X as sitting as a subspace of S of X. S of X is a kind of completion. 
Well, but that's enough to actually show that S is left a drawing to U. Let, um, yeah, almost enough. We'll see. Okay. Normally we have all ingredients. So let me try to reproduce that, that, that diagram. So let me take X, any topological space. Okay. And we have that eta X map. But now we have to be more serious. Uh, to me now, S of X should be a sober space. Not a topological space. So it's an object of the category sub, not top. If I want to make that an object of top, I have to convert it by the do-nothing operator U. Okay, so actually I have to write that more seriously as U applied to S of X. Okay, that's fine. I mean, U is meant to be as on the right side of the inverted turnstile here. That's the right place. So we already have that, and it's indeed a morphism. It's indeed a continuous map in the category of topological spaces. Now let me take any continuous map, F, so any morphism, huh? okay, so any continuous map from X to U of Y, where Y is an object of sub. So that actually means that F is a continuous map whose target space is a sober topological space. Now I want to show that that map extends, so remember that S of X, or U of X is the same space, Okay, is a superspace of X, uh, up to isomorphism. So I want to extend F from a small space to a larger space. And I want to show that it extends, but uniquely, even that. All right, so how, which, uh, how should we do that? Well, uh, I don't know whether I have enough room here, but let's try. So we are looking for F hat, it should go from f of x, which is a subrification of x, to y. Those are two sober spaces. It should be morphism, so it should be continuous. And I want it to satisfy that commutativity. So u f hat is a map that does the same thing as f hat. So let's just write f hat. f hat applied to eta x of any element, that is a downward closure of x, should be equal to f of x, phi of x. So you know that when you want to show that there's a unique map, the standard strategy is let's prove uniqueness first, because it will tell you what the only possible solution is, and then you take that as a definition, and you sh show that it exists. All right. Um, yeah, that sounds complicated. So let's do a more clever thing. Um, so what I will do is, instead of saying what it does on elements, I will try to say what the inverse images do on open sets. For those people who know, that means I'm going to the stone dual, actually. So that is, I'm applying the O functor and looking at what happens on the side of lattices. But, okay, so what it means is that for so that's all okay, that's one thing I want, but really what I would like is also that for every open set of Y, V, the inverse image of V by F should also be the same as the inverse image by the composite of these two things. So F minus 1 of V should be equal to the inverse image by the composite of these two things. So this is going to be eta X minus 1 of f hat minus 1 of v. Now, uh, you know that f hat minus 1 of v is going to be open in the subrification of x. And the open sets there are all of the form diamond something. So, uh, if you can write f diamond uh, minus 1 of v as diamond u, that means, question mark, you see that we don't have it, we want it. Okay. Same here. So we want, so this is going to be eta x minus 1 of diamond u. So that is just u. So we want f minus 1 of v to be u. Okay, so for every v, you know f minus 1 of v. 
F minus 1 of V should be equal to U. So F diamond minus 1 of V should be equal to diamond U. So you don't have any choice for every V open in Y. The inverse image by F hat of V should be diamond F minus 1 V. Okay, it doesn't say that F diamond is unique. Well, not yet, or not in any obvious way yet. Um, but what does it say? It says that O of F, you know, the frame map associated to F hat, the map that sends open sets of this, Y to open sets of that, is uniquely determined. Which is already a good thing to have. Well, in fact, if I had shown the other junction first, I could have told you that as soon as you know the frame map associated to a continuous map, you know between sober spaces, you know the continuous map immediately. But I haven't justified that yet, so I will do now. Uh, the whiteboard is a bit small, so I will just erase this. Although it may come in handy later. Okay. So, oh, perhaps here. So imagine I have a frame homomorphism from a frame, well, okay, from the open set lattice of a space Y to the open set lattice of a space X. And it's a frame homomorphism. Oh, by the way, is, is that formula, does that formula give you a frame homomorphism? That would mean it preserves finite intersections and arbitrary unions. Okay, so if you replace V by finite intersection, F minus 1 commutes with all intersections, all unions, even complements, everything. Okay? Diamond commutes with finite intersections. So the composite of the two commutes with finite intersections. Arbitrary unions? Well, F minus 1 commutes with arbitrary unions. And I said earlier, the diamond commutes with arbitrary unions. So that is really a frame homomorphism. Okay, so now imagine you have a frame homomorphism between two open set lattices of topological spaces, and at least one of them is sober. For safety, let me assume that both of them are sober. Where x, y are sober. Well, I claim there is a unique continuous map f from x to y such that phi is really O of f which is the map that sends every open set to the inverse image of that open set. So let me call that f minus 1. Um, okay, how do you build that? Well, for every x in x, you know that, well, how can you get a grip on f of x? Well, you can look at all its open neighborhoods. So you know that for every open set, v is an open neighborhood of f of x, so f of x is in v, if and only if x is in f minus 1 of v. Oh, but we want phi to be equal to f minus 1. So we look at uh, so we look at the set of open sets in Y such that X is in phi of V and that should be the set of open neighborhoods of F of X. Maybe I'm a bit quick. Let me recall what we're doing. Okay, imagine phi is indeed equal to F minus 1 for some continuous map. Then what I've written here is a set of V's such that X is in F minus 1 of V. Hence I've written the set of V's such that F of X is in V. That is, I've written the set of open neighborhoods of a point, which is F of X. And I have the set of open neighborhoods 
And I would like to show that it's a set of open neighborhoods of a unique point. And if you remember, uh, there's the definition of a server space. And it says something like, uh, one definition was something with irreducible closed subsets. But another one was, it's a space where every completely prime filter of open sets is actually the uh, set of open neighborhoods of a unique point. So you only have to show that this is a completely prime filter. So you have plenty of conditions to check. <laughs> okay? So, not on the white ball. You have to check that the top element is in it. That is, that the whole space Y satisfies this. Well, phi of the whole space Y is the whole space X, because phi preserves finite intersections, in particular empty intersections, and the empty intersection is top. Okay. So, is X in big X? Yes, certainly. Okay. Every point of the space is in the space. <laughs> okay. Okay, next you have to show that this is upwards closed. So, if V satisfies that, and you take a, and you increase V, well, you increase phi of V, because phi uh, preserves finite intersections, for example, so it's monotonic. So phi of V increases, and if X belongs to a small set, it belongs to any larger set. Then it's a filter. So if V1 and V2 are in there, V1 inter V2 is in there. Why? If V1 is in there, that means X is in phi of V1. It's also in phi of V2. So it's in phi of V1 inter phi of V2. And because phi is a frame homomorphism, it is phi of V1 inter V2. Okay? Uh, so what you've gotten is that V1 inter V2 is also in there. So we've used uh, the fact that uh, phi preserved finite intersections. The fact that it preserves arbitrary unions shows that it's completely prime. So let me perhaps write it down. So imagine that the union of vi's is in that set. That means that x is in phi of the union of the vi's. But that is equal to the union of the phi's of vi's, because phi preserves arbitrary unions. So x, so there is a y such that x is in phi of vi, and that shows that that vi is in that set. And this is exactly the definition that this set is completely prime. So it's a completely prime filter of open sets. So it's the open neighborhood of a unique point. This must, this point must be f of x. So that shows that. If there is a map f that satisfies that phi is equal to O of f, that map is determined uniquely. Then you define f of x as being the unique point of which this is a set of open neighborhoods. This is automatically continuous. Because you have defined it such that a phi coincides with f minus 1. But phi maps opens to opens. So f is automatically continuous. And you are essentially done. It's, all, it's a bit like algebra, you know. You push symbols, and you have, as I said uh, in another session, you have a square symbol, you put it in the square hole, you have a round symbol, you put it in the round hole. It's likely that you don't even understand what you're doing, but in the end it works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it works. It's some kind of magic. Yeah, it's some kind of magic, yes. Um, okay, so essentially the, this thing here, which maps a v to diamond f minus 1 v now, is a frame homomorphism between sober spaces, and so it's, the, it's indeed the f minus, the minus 1 of a unique continuous map, which is going to be f hat. And we, are, we have finished here. But of course I've cheated. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So it's something like, okay, so there are some things that I have not checked, really, uh, and mostly I've given you some kind of uh, magic path <laughs> to the final solution, which says, oh, that exists, you have no idea what it is. And uh, so here's another piece of magic where, where I'm going to show you what it is, and we'll check 
that it actually works. But then you'll tell me, how come did you have that idea that it should be this formula? <laughs> well, of course, you can do that part of magic and do the actual computations, okay? Remember that you get points as being, you know, the larger points of reducible closed subsets and that the reducible closed subsets are the unions of whatever is not in your completely prime filter. So you do pushing symbols a long time and eventually you get to the formula I'm going to give you. Oh, that formula will not show you that f hat is unique, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, in fact, f hat of x is, aha, uh, sorry, not a, x, f hat starts from here, so it, 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 it takes a irreducible closed subset c. Okay, so how do you define it? Well, um, you can take the image of C by F. So most people write that F, open parenthesis C, closing parenthesis C. And I hate that notation, especially because I'm working with uh, hyperspaces. The, uh, hyperspace is a space whose elements are subsets of the other space. <laughs> so if you do that, after some time you don't know whether F of C means the image of F the image by f of an element c that happens to be a subset. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. You see the problem. Okay? So I tend to use the notation f uh, square bracket c to say the image of c by f, uh, but I also use it for different purposes. So, uh, so the problem is that we essentially have finitely many notations in mathematics, although we do have plenty of them, but essentially the, use, the useful ones, the ones that can be read, are finitely many. <laughs> so I know that some people, uh, I won't cite him, but uh, he was my PhD advisor, uh, was, a, was a very um, inventive person as far as notation, uh, notation was concerned, but I decided not to follow his example. So let's take the image uh, of that irreducible closed subset C by F. Does it give you a closed set? No. No, no. The answer is no. no. <laughs> the image by a continuous map of a closed set is in general not closed. But we don't care. Let's take the closure. <laughs> now it's closed. Okay. I claim that this set is irreducible. Okay. This is irreducible. And this is irreducible in Y, which is sober. So is the downward closure of a unique point. And so this is defined as the unique point such that the closure of Y of the image by, of, F by, of C by F is the closure of Y. Hence it's the downward closure. If you prefer, of course, you can get explicitly what that point is because it's the largest point of that closure. So I could say that f hat of c is the unique largest point of the closure in y of f of c. And that exists because the space is sober. So let me check that this is irreducible. Uh, let me also remove some of these things. Okay, remember, an irreducible closed subset is a non-empty set such that. So certainly that is non-empty because C is non-empty being irreducible. So now what we have to check is that uh, assume that closure of Y of F of C intersects two open sets. We want to show that it intersects their intersection. So imagine that it intersects Z1. Imagine that it intersects V2. We want to show that it intersects V1 into V2. The first thing you should not do, <laughs> but you will be tempted to do, is to say, oh, since that intersection is, em is not empty, there's a point in the intersection. Forget it. That leads nowhere. <laughs> no, the first thing you should do is when you see 
that you say that an open set intersects the closure of something, you should immediately conclude that the open set also intersects the thing below the closure. Mm -hmm. I think I have said that a few months ago, so you have no, no excuse not remembering that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So let me find some small piece of paper, or board rather. So, okay, let me, let me try to say that in the in picture. You have a set A, which is here f of c. You take its closure, which is the closure of A, and you have an open set which intersects the closure of A. So in the worst case, that would be this. It would intersect the closure of A, but apparently not A. But that can't happen. That can't happen because of the definition of the closure of A. So the closure of A is by definition the smallest closed set that contains A. Okay. So you look at all the closed sets that contain A, you push that as far below as you can. Okay? You remove everything that can be removed while remaining a closed set and still containing A. But now look at the complements of what you're doing. You're taking open sets that don't intersect A, take the largest possible one, and suddenly the largest possible one uh, is a complement of the closure of A. So if you look at the picture, that means that, oh, damn, the largest possible one doesn't contain V. OK? And you assume that V was disjoint from A. So you had one open set not containing A. But the largest open set not containing A uh, doesn't contain V. What's that? That's a contradiction. OK, there are lots of negations in what I just said. <laughs> but essentially, imagine that uh, the largest open set that uh, doesn't meet A, uh, where is it? But well, it, it must contain V, whatever you do. Okay? So if V intersects closure of A, that means that V is not inside the lar that largest open set. Yeah. So it's impossible that it be disjoint from A. So, that's the standard trick in topology. So now you know that... Um, mm -hmm. So now you know that f of c intersects v1, f of c intersects v2, and now you can take an element. But an element of f of c is something of the form f of x with x in c. And you're saying that you have an element in C whose image by F is in V1. So you have an element in C which is in F minus 1 of V1. So C intersects F minus 1 of V1 and similarly for the other one. But now C is irreducible closed and it intersects two open sets so it intersects their intersection. So C intersects F minus 1 of V1 inter intersected with F minus 1 of V2. And F minus 1 commutes with intersection. So C intersected with F minus 1 of V1 inter V2 is non-empty. And you do the same kind of reasoning in reverse. And so you happen to realize that F of C intersects V1 inter V2. Hence, closure of F of C intersects V1 into V2, and that shows that indeed that object is irreducible. Okay, so I claim that uh, the solution to our problem, F hat, is uh, that map defined in a funny way. Well, of course, the whiteboard hasn't uh, enlarged, so I'll have to erase something. And I'm sorry, I'm going to erase what I have just wrote, written. So now, because we haven't defined it by stone dual, we have to check that this is continuous. Before, that was for free. We had built it in such a way that it mapped opens to open. So anything we could find was continuous by design. Now here we have to check that it actually uh, is continuous. So, what is f hat minus 1 of v? Oh, by the way, I sincerely hope I will retrieve that formula. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs>
Um, so f diamond minus 1 of v is the set of points C. Oh, yeah. The points in S of x are a reducible closed subset. Such that uh, that unique y such that blah blah blah. Okay. So the unique y such that closure in big Y of f of c is downward closure of y is in v. Okay. Let me reuse the picture corner. <laughs> Okay, so you have closure of f of c. It is actually everything below unique point y. When is that unique point in an open set v? Well, it's exactly when the closure here meets v. Okay. If y is in v, then certainly the closure meets v at y. And conversely, if the closure meets v at any point, then y is above that point and hence is still in the open set v. So that is exactly the set of c's such that the closure y f of c intersects v. We have done that already, right? So this is a set of c's such that c intersects f minus 1 of v. Oh, but then that is exactly the definition of diamond f minus 1 of v. Good! That's the, that is the expected formula. Okay? So the last thing you should actually check is that the diagram commutes. And so if you apply f hat to eta x of x, so diamond closure of x, aha, what is that? All right, this is the unique y such that the closure in y of the image of downward closure of x is downward closure of y. Oh, but this is very simple. What is the image of downward closure of x by f? Well, I don't know. It's, it's complicated. But Let's, let me reuse that corner here. In that space, you suddenly have f of x. Right? And um, you suddenly have f of x because x is in the downward closure of x, hence f of x is in the image, and the closure is only bigger. Okay? Now, uh, if you take any other point in f downward closure of x, it's obtained as f of blah with blah below x. And have I said that every continuous map was automatically monotonic? Well, let me say it now. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't believe me, it's monotonic with respect to the specialization ordering, and it's an easy exercise. So if I take any other point here, it's of the form f of blah with blah below x, so it's below f of x. So I know that f of downward closure of x, so it's included in the downward closure of f of x. Okay. Now you can check that um, the closure is downward closed. So the smallest closed set containing that it contains the smallest downward closed set. So that closure actually contains this, contains the downward closure of f of x. But conversely, the downward closure of f of x is closed, and it contains f of downward closure of x, so it must contain the smallest closed set, which is its closure. So that closure is actually this. It's actually the downward closure of f of x. And I said, oh, f hat of diamond x is the unique point such that blah 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 is the diamond closure of y and it's also the diamond closure of f of x. So it's f of x. Okay? So this is f of x. So we have done a complete verification, almost complete verification, okay, that s is left adjoined to u. So what does it mean? Last time we had said that 
If you took the uh, underlying functor from monoids to sets, you got a functor that mapped every set to the free monoid over x. So what have we gotten here? We have gotten that S of x, the sobrification of x, is the free sober space over x. The nice thing about category theory is I don't have to tell you what the free sober space x is over a topological space uh, in that context. It's part of a general definition. The less nice thing is that it requires you at least one hour to understand what that means. <laughs> So that is why I wanted to tell you about adjunctions. Uh, we have a situation of an adjunction. In particular, we know that we are building the a kind of universal sober space on top of a sober space X. It's a, it's a solution to a universal problem. That universal problem is here. It sounds complicated. But it's a, it's a kind of, uh, of um, let's say, indication of quality in mathematics. An adjunction is a free structure. It's the least thing you could build that satisfies being sober and containing X, essentially. So if there are no questions, I can try to go to the more complicated case of O and PT. So as I said, it's more complicated because we will need to take ops of categories. And we are changing categories as well. Uh, I could have kept one, by the way. So now we take the following two categories, top, topological spaces and continuous maps, and we take the category of frames with frame homomorphisms. And I'm starting by writing something which is wrong. The nice thing with whiteboard and also, and also blackboards as well, <laughs> is that you can change things sometimes. And I won't erase, I will add. Okay. <laughs> so there is a functor, O. Okay, I want to say that O is left adjoined to point. So O goes from top to something like frame. I don't want to say it's frame. Okay. And so eventually what I show is that which is incredibly funny. It says that the lattice of open sets of a topological space is its free, well, almost frame, over x. And uh, if you didn't have the categorical definition, you would have never think of that kind of thing. A free thing usually is something you build out of a term algebra and you quotient by some uh, uh, equations. And this is not at all what you do here. So anyway, we want to define that functor. At the level of objects, it maps the topological space to its frame of open sets. Fine. But what does it do at the level of morphisms? You have a continuous map from x to y. What can you do with that? Well, what you can do is what I wrote here, essentially. You have a map from OY to OX, which is a frame homomorphism, and which is F minus 1. But damn, it doesn't go in the right direction. It goes from OY to OX instead of OX to OY. Category theories have the answer. Up! That is an arrow in the wrong direction for frame, but it's in the right direction if you reverse arrows. So that is an arrow in frame, and so OX to OY, uh, let's say F minus 1, well, I don't know, it's misleading, okay? Uh, is the corresponding arrow in frame up. So this is what I'm saying by saying that uh, uh, it makes you lose your mind, because after some time you have a map and it goes in the wrong direction, and suddenly you think, oh, but I'm in the opposite category. So that arrow in the wrong direction is actually in the right direction. <laughs> so anyway, you can check that it is a functor. And there's also a functor PT, which goes from frame up 
to top. Okay, it maps every uh, frame omega to pt of omega, the space of points of that frame, and it maps every frame homomorphism. Now pay attention. So it's a frame homomorphism from omega to omega prime in frame, meaning that it's actually morphism from omega prime to omega right, in that category. So here what we want is a morphism from Pt omega prime to Pt omega. Well, I claim that you get a continuous map by taking phi minus 1. And then you're lost because of typing. Oh. So let me check that. So what I claim here is that if you take a frame homomorphism as follows, if you define a map that sends every completely prime filter of omega prime to phi minus one of it, then you get a completely prime filter of that. Um, that's actual just v immediate verification, nothing to, in, to understand from that. Um, so, if I take a completely prime filter X prime, remember my uh, strange uh, habit of denoting completely prime filters as though they were points of some space. Um, so, a completely prime filter, I look at phi minus 1 of X prime, so phi minus prime of X prime is a set of elements of omega such that phi of u is in x. Huh? Well, I claim this is a completely prime filter. Uh, let me check just the complete prime property. So, if you have a supremum of a family, okay, which is in that thing, phi minus 1 of x prime. Well, expand the definition. That means that phi of the supremum of the vi's is in x. But phi commutes with all uh, uh, joints, or uh, suprema. So that means the supremum of the phi of vi's is in x. Oh, but then remember, th uh, sorry, x prime. But then remember that x prime is a point, so it's completely prime. So that means that there is an i such that phi of vi is in x prime, and hence vi is in phi minus 1 of x prime. So we have shown that if you take a supremum which is in there, then some uh, component of that supremum is also already in there. And everything works like that, okay? It's a filter for by using finite intersections instead of infinite uh, unions. So we, have actu we actually have a map here. Uh, which actually maps points of omega prime to points of omega. Uh, I should check that this is a map that is continuous, but now I have a problem with notations because I want to show that the inverse image by phi minus one of something of an open set is open. So okay, let me not call it phi minus one. Let me just call it pt of phi. After all, this is what you should call it because Pt is a functor. Okay, this is the image of that morphism by the functor Pt. So now let's check that Pt of phi is continuous. So what does this mean? That means that if you take Pt of phi minus 1 of an arbitrary open set here, what is an open set of Pt omega? Well, it's something that I wrote big O of u where for every u in omega, big O of u is the set of completely prime filters, so elements of Pt omega, such that, and then remember, x is in OU if and only if u is in x. That was uh, something that reverted the, mem the membership relation. So it's a set of completely prime filters which contain u. So now we check that this is open. 
How do you do that? Well, just algebra, you know, pushing symbols without understanding. So this is the set of points x prime in PT omega prime, such that PT of phi, PT of phi is phi minus one, is in OU. Use the definition. This is a set of points x prime, such that U is in phi minus one of x prime. So this is a set of points x prime, such that phi of U is in x prime. Oh, but then that is just O phi U. In particular, that's open. As I said, pushing symbols without understanding. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine, but for five minutes, I guess. Yes. <laughs> okay, so now I claim we have two functors. How do I show that they are that they form an adjunction? Let me check the time. Do I do the long version or the short version? Oh, that would have to be the short version. <laughs> um, hmm. Do you even need to look at the clock? What? Do you even need to look at the clock? Yes, I do need to look at the clock, <laughs> yes. Um, but I'm afraid the short version is not much shorter than the long version. No. <laughs> so I have to tell you that there's an equivalent definition of adjunction, which is usually less practical, but in that case it is going to be more practical. I have probably already mentioned this, by the way, but I'm not completely sure. The alternate definition is that you should have two functors, uh, so u from d to c, so I wrote u uh, on the right, so u goes from d to c, f goes from c to d, and there should be two so-called natural transformations, one called eta x, or well, eta, a, the transformation is a collection of morphisms, what for each object x. Okay. That should go from x to u f x. This is actually what we wrote here. But it should be natural. And natural means that uh, if you have any morphism from x to y, then of course you can go from f x to f y by applying functor f. And then by applying functor u, you can go from u f x to u f y. And you can go from z x to u f x by eta x, and you can go from y to u f i by eta y. And natural means that you don't care. Uh, you can go this way or that way, that's the same morphism. Uh, you should also have another natural transformation, so indexed by objects of the other category y, which goes from f u y to y, it, also, it should also be natural. This one is called the unit of the adjunction. This one is called the co-unit of the adjunction. And on top of these naturality diagrams, it should satisfy two additional diagrams. But if you've done some rewriting theory, you realize it's some kind of confluence property. Uh, so it says, OK, imagine I started from UY. And uh, now from UI, I can apply, um, what can I apply? I can apply eta at UI, and this will give me uh, a UF in front, so UF UI. And then you realize that uh, I've added a UF, but in fact, inside the U, now there's an FU. So you can use epsilon under a U, and this will go to UI. Okay, so if you're from rewriting theory, you would say, oh, I already know a map from UI to UI. And to simplify things, it would be nice if these two were just the same. So, yeah, identity, so an adjunction, equivalent definition. So it's much more complicated, okay? It's two functors, two natural transformations, so satisfying these, such that the following two diagrams commute. <gasps> That's a lot. So the other one is the other one, it's a symmetric. So you start from f of x, so if you do that, uh, you can use f of eta at x and it gives you f u f x, and now you can rewrite f u into, you can remove f u using e epsilon at f x, it gives you f x, 
And you require that this is also the identity. Okay, um, I won't put, oh, let's assume that this is a short version. The short version is to say that these two definitions are equivalent and not giving any proof. The long version would be give the proof. Okay. okay. Uh, if you look at what this gives you, so okay, if you start from the definition we had earlier, the unit is already given. What's funny is that a big F, which was just a map from objects to objects, also extends to an actual functor. So you have to prove that. And by the way, the fun well, I won't give every definition. The interesting thing is the co-unit, when the co-unit is obtained by the following diagram here, you, uh, so of course it should be obtained this way, from f of x to y, and you ask for f u y to y. So it's obtained by using the case where x here is of the form u y. So you just take as a diagram, if x is equal to u y, then you have eta u y goes to u f u y, and since the diagram works for any map to u y, in particular it works for the identity map. So there is a unique map which goes from f u y to y. Let's call it the co-unit, which satisfies that u epsilon y commutes. And suddenly you realize that this is the diagram we wrote here. Okay. And um, so actually you can build it. So for example, in the case of uh, the free monoid, so y is a monoid, you forget it's a monoid, you, it's just a set for you, okay? Uh, there's the identity map to here, and what you say is that you can embed that monoid inside this. And if you look at what this is, it is a set of words over the monoid. So that is, it's just the set of finite sequence of elements of the monoid. Okay? And the operation here is just concatenation of lists. You have, anyway, you have completely forgotten that you had a multiplication here. And so what you're saying is that there is a unique monoid homomorphism from lists of elements of the monoid to the monoid itself, which commutes with whatever. Well, there's only one you can think of. It's just, take the product of all the elements of the list. Okay. So the co-unit in the case of uh, the adjunction that defines free monoids is the, ho is the monoid homomorphism that maps every list of words to their product. You can check it's a monoid homomorphism. It maps concatenations to products. Uh, by the way, for the previous adjunction, S the uh, term style u, the co-unit is even simpler, it's the identity map. <laughs> Exercise. <laughs> um, but so it turns out that uh, if you have this, you can have all that, and if you have all that, then you have that by symbol pushing. But finally, you need all those properties just to prove that. So now let me check that we indeed have an adjunction in that situation. Let me erase a few things. This. And let's get lost in the maze of opposites of categories. Okay. So I need to find a unit, A types, that should go from every Oh, okay, let me check what the categories are, okay? So, I'm saying that O should be, I had said that here, O should be on the left, okay? So it should be F. We're going to do some uh, pretty simple pattern matching. This is meant to be F, this is meant to be U. So F goes from C to D, so C should be top, D should be frame up. Oh, by the way, the opposite of the category of frames has a name. It's called the category of locales. But the objects are the same, okay? Locales are frames. The difference is the morphism. Okay? So here that's D, 
that C, okay, now we need a morphism uh, from X to U of X, but I haven't said it which category here, so um, that, that is in C, okay, and epsilon is in D. So the first one I need is in C, which is top. So I need a continuous map from topological spaces X to U, PT, F, O of X. Oh, we already had it and we already had named it epsilon, uh, eta, I mean. Okay, that is the map that sends every point to the set of open neighborhoods of X, which is a completely prime filter of open sets. So we have it. Oh, at least it's a good candidate, but I can swear that it's the right one. Now, this, uh, here comes the, the complicated part. We need a co-unit. And so we'll try to find one that type checks, okay? And uh, since we'll be only able to find one, we hope it is the right one. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I call that proof by type checking, you know, sometimes it works. <laughs> Well, then you have to check that it works. So, okay, epsilon y. Y is an object in D. D is frame on. So, let me call it omega, just to remind you that it should be frame. Okay, it should go from F u omega. So, F is O. U is P t. Uh, I tend to write at the wrong places, apparently, yeah? So it goes from this to omega. But the arrow is reversed. The arrow is reversed. So what I want is an arrow from this to that in frame. I want an arrow in the opposite direction in frame off, so I want an arrow in this direction in frame. Uh, then, what should I take as a candidate? It should map, it should be frame homomorphism, and it should map any element of omega to an open set in that. An open set in that is an O sub an element in here. Well, let's take U. <laughs> oh, and by the way, so it is a frame homomorphism. We had seen earlier that this construction commutes with all finite, finite myths and all uh, arbitrary uh, joints. So this is a frame homomorphism. So now we have to check that these two things are natural transformations. Mm -hmm. This is the ever boring thing. Nobody ever checks naturality. Okay. In category theory papers, beginners actually say it is easy to check that it is natural. Professionals don't say anything. <laughs> and by the way, of course, from time to time, uh, it is not natural. And that's just a mistake. <laughs> That's life. But that's boring. Um, and you know what, mm, uh, what teachers in mathematics do with boring things? They, they leave that as exercises to the reader. So, okay. <laughs> okay, so we won't consider that. We'll just try to check these things. Uh, okay, for the first one. Oh, yeah, and then I need to reverse arrows on the fly. Huh? And also, I need to do minus ones on the fly. Done. <laughs> um, so in particular, let's uh, examine right away. Um, no, we don't need to find. Okay. So let's examine the first one. So we take a frame omega. So y is omega. We take its u. Its u is p t of omega. It's a topological space. We map it through eta. To what? Uh, when we add uh, pt and omega in front. Uh, sorry, pt and o in front. Okay. That's eta. What does it do? Well, it takes a point, completely prime filter, and maps it to the set of open neighborhoods of X. Now we apply U of Epsilon. No, not Omega, PT of Omega. So what does U of Epsilon do? Well, U is PT 
And we do PT of epsilon at omega. Okay, so PT of epsilon, what it does is epsilon minus 1. This is what we had written here. So what I obtain here is epsilon minus 1, epsilon omega minus 1, or the set of open neighborhoods of x. Hmm, what is that? Well, this is the set of elements u in omega, such that OU is in Nx. Is that right? So that says such that epsilon of u, which is OU, is in that Nx. Okay. But being an open neighborhood of X for an open set means that X should be no U. So I've swapped the two things as you've seen, okay? But X is in OU means U is in X. So I'm swapping again. So the set of U's that are in X, so that is just X, oh yes, that's the identity. Okay. Now for the final one, we start from f of x. No, now x is a topological space. f uh, is, is the frame of open sets. We do O of eta x, and we go to O p t O x. So what does this do? We take an open set U, and what we build is O eta x of u, but O, it's also minus 1. So what I get here is eta x minus 1 of u. Now I apply epsilon at O of x. And what does epsilon do? Well, it maps that to O sub this. All right. Oh, forgot. The open sets of O of X. So, sorry. Um, yeah, so at some point I must have made a mistake because I have not uh, swapped the direction of arrows any place. <laughs> and that is wrong, okay? <laughs> so those arrows are not in the right direction. So let me start again. Here I have eta x which goes from x to pt o x. I apply f, which is o, so it indeed goes from this to that in frame up. But I really would like to reason in frame. So actually the arrow goes in the other direction. Let me say what it does later. Okay, let me first correct the direction of arrows. Next, epsilon indeed goes from fu fx to fx in frame off. So in frame it goes in the other direction, from ox to opt ox. As I said, it can drive you crazy. Um, okay, so what does it do now? We take an open set u here, and we map it to o sub u, big u now. And now, we map that to eta x minus 1 of O big U. But what is that? So that is a set of points x such that the neighborhood of x, that is eta x of small x, is in O big U. And we do the same thing as before. Uh, well, no, it's not the same thing, but we still swap this thing twice. So, Nx is in OU definition, if and only if U is in Nx. So that is equivalent to U is in Nx. And that is equivalent to X is in U, and so this is U. So this is indeed the identity. So we have got a, another junction. O is left adjoint to PT, meaning that for every topological space, O of X is the free locale over the topological space X, whatever that means. 